Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to the fourth annual Women's Business in Leadership in Tech Conference. My name is Sarah Smuller and I'm a member of the class of 2021 at Columbia Business School. And it is my pleasure to officially welcome my fellow students, faculty members, staff, alumni, and other industry professionals to this event. Today, we will hear from Jorge Guzman, Assistant Professor of Business Management at Columbia Business School, where he teaches strategy formulation and entrepreneurial strategy. Jorge will discuss insights from his exponential research regarding gender perceptions in relation to female-led tech ventures. As a reminder, attendees will have a chance to ask questions throughout the conversation via the Q&A box. So please submit your questions there and I will return to address those questions following the presentation. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Jorge Guzman. Hi everybody, uh, it's very nice to see you. It's very nice to, to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very excited to present this work. Uh, it was originally titled The Gender Gap in Entrepreneurship, but I sort of, uh, in the process of preparing my slides, I um, added a little bit more and, and I realized this is the gender gap in the entrepreneurship pipeline. And so that adds a little bit of context. Uh, please do, do, do submit your questions through the Q&A in the chat. Um, even though we're just going to get to them at the end, it's going to be a lot more fun uh, if, if you have a lot of questions. Um, quick introduction, Sarah, thank you for introducing me, uh, but that's me. Uh, everything that Sarah said, I do research in entrepreneurship uh, and I teach entrepreneurial strategy. Sarah is actually in my class and today we're actually talking about identity in class, which is actually really fitting um, for the topic today. Uh, what I'm talking about you today is not about kind of, because obviously demographics, who we are, um, our race, our age, our gender is very important part of identity and the way it shapes entrepreneurship. Uh, but today we're taking a more kind of societal perspective to talk about the gender gap in entrepreneurship. And so I'm going to tell you about three things today. First, I'm going to tell you about this decomposing the gender gap in entrepreneurship, thinking about the pipeline, etc. Then I'm going to actually uh, talk about difference between men and women in some study we did. And third, I am going to give you some perspective on the impact of COVID-19 on the entrepreneurship gender gap, then some kind of key takeaways uh, again, just keep submitting through the chat and, and I'll read all of them and get through as much as, as we can. Um, so let me, um, without further ado, jump to this first piece. And what I want to do here is I want to tell you about this study uh, that I did with, with my co-author, Olenka Kasperschick, titled The Gender Gap in Entrepreneurship. And the idea we had here was that, you know, when we think about gender gaps, we, we often do think about this idea of a, of a pipeline, right? So here's a version of that. Uh, for for the STEM gender gap, where you know it's we know that it the women that enter college uh, only a small portion graduate in STEM, and then sort of they a lot of them don't work in STEM over kind of an extended period of time. It turns out if you look at uh, there's a lot of interesting and fascinating work thinking about the challenges um, on entrepreneurship across genders, but they're sort of all focused on what what it's like once you're an entrepreneur, right? Once you've raised VC, how difficult it is, et cetera, which is definitely a good, a good kind of angle, but we wanted to kind of take the opposite, the opposite perspective here and ask, well, what about this, this kind of pipeline? What about the sense that you get when you get pipe, when you see pipeline studies is that it's not only the challenges for the entrepreneurs that exist today, but actually that there may be a lot of missing entrepreneurs. A lot of people that somehow end up not starting companies or, even when they started companies, they're sort of maybe a little bit more local and ambitious than they would like. And we felt there was a lot of kind of lack of clarity against that angle. And, and so we decided, we decided to tackle that um, by taking advantage of, of, of an interesting data set. I'll tell you about that in just a second. And so, okay, so here's your questions, right? Uh, you know, thinking clearly about the gender gap pipeline, how much do women represent as the share of US entrepreneurship compared to men? How are these new firms more or less likely to be growth oriented, right? So it's not only the number of firms, but here today is the women business leadership in tech. So I think we're all thinking about these kind of tech oriented companies, you know, that have a shot at raising venture capital. How does this affect actually, you know, the types of companies that women start, et cetera, the chances to get venture capital. And, and then if we can learn a little bit about uh, what types of discrimination drive venture capital. And so 
we took advantage of this data set, um, which is sort of a lot of my work is around, it's called the Startup Cartography Project. The Startup Cartography Project is a project where we go and basically get the business registration data for sort of specific states over across the US across an extended period of time. Basically, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, there's a very obvious thing you have to do. And it is, you have to actually go to City Hall and register or, you know, do, do this online and register a corporation, an LLC or a partnership that is like a real business you have to do. And so what we did was we actually worked with each of the different secretary of states in different states to get the registration of every business, right? And we have, here's just an example, just to see what it looks like. This is country curtains mail order, like just a random company is founded in Massachusetts. It's a domestic for profit. Here's the address, uh, the name of the agent. Um, and, you know, we also have the directors further down, et cetera. And so we have all the, you know, founding date and a series of other things. Um, and so we focus here in two, two specific states, uh, you know, which is the data that we had at the time, we later have more, uh, which is California and Massachusetts. We also chose these states because they're particularly uh, kind of more clearly oriented to this tech idea and they represent the two biggest markets of venture capital, for example. And so we thought it, would, it was an interesting setting um, to look into it. And um, all right, so with that, let me begin by giving you, and we basically look at the evolution we use the gender based on who is the director and the president of the firm at the time of founding. And we're trying to understand how do these company, you know, what share of all companies are, that are founded are women, how they look different and what, how might these t help us explain some of the variance uh, in the gender gap in entrepreneurship. And so um, here's, I think it's a little bit of a sovereign reality, um, but just so you get a sense of it, there's sort of a big pipeline issue, right? You know, obviously like, you know, half of the pop US population are women. They do represent a much lower share of all business registered. Women led businesses are just 22%. But there's also sort of, as you move further up these kind of technology orientation or, you know, in different ways, right? Then the, you know, women that get venture capital only re represent getting venture, companies that get venture capital, only 10% are 10 of them are led by women. Companies that achieve some equity outcome like IPO or being acquired is only 7%. Uh, we come up with this measure called growth orientation that also takes into account, you know, if you're like a Delaware firm, if you have a patent, if you kind of register for trademarks, things that we usually see uh, are done by entrepreneurs kind of seeking to grow. There it represents slightly more, 13%. Um, and so, you know, there are about three to four times as many male, more, more male than female entrepreneurs, but there is nine times as many uh, male and female entrepreneurs once you consider only venture back firms, for example. So first thing, first thing that I would love for you to see in these results, uh, there appears to be a meaningful kind of pipeline issue. Um, this doesn't seem to have changed that much over time, right? So from 1995 to 2011, it went from 20 to 25%. I, know that's sort of a step in the right direction, but it seems pretty slow if you ask me, uh, considering what we would have expected out of like kind of 17 years of data. Um, then the next thing we do is we actually grab all the characteristics in this registration file and ask ourselves, well, how do these characteristics allow explaining some of the venture capital gender gap, right? So I already told you that women are not only less likely to start companies, but even conditional starting company, less likely to file a patent, a trademark, et cetera. And we actually found that, find that two thirds of the gender gap in venture capital uh, is accounted for by just very simple observables that you can look at when the companies are getting founded. And so it seems it's not only that women represent less companies, but it's also the type of companies that are getting founded are less you know, maybe you would call them growth oriented or kind of this kind of venture back type or that kind of thing. And so that's the second thing that, you know, which is consistent with the graph I showed you before. And third, you know, we actually can try to use some of these data to try to assess if there's, we see on the venture capital side, what it may be consistent with. And so we find that women that have less indicators of high potential, like they're sort of suffer a bigger gap and more experienced VC investors appear to have a lower gender gap this is not conclusive, but we actually think it's somewhat consistent with the idea that there's this idea called type kind of 
is statistical discrimination, which is investors are not good at understanding companies all the time. And so they rely on gender as a noisy signal and, and they discount gender rather than some kind of more inherent a bias, we call it, right? Which is like, they don't want to work with women, et cetera. This is, you know, but this is kind of towards the end. Um, there's, here's some validations. If you like validations, time periods, et cetera. Um, so that's study number one, right? I wanted to tell you a little bit about these, the STEM gap in the, as in STEM, the gender gap in entrepreneurship is best seen as, a, as this idea of a leaky pipeline with no single piece kind of covering the whole gap. It's about, you know, who actually starts a company. It's about the types of companies they do. It's about, there's issues, even if you have a good company in raising VC, and it appears quite persistent over time. And so that's kind of idea number one I would love you to take away. Now, the second thing we did, though, was we actually then wanted to go deeper. This is with a different set of co-authors, right? Gino and Ananya Sen. We wanted to go deeper into at least, you know, maybe understand just not how is this kind of pipeline shrinking, but how are these entrepreneurs different amongst themselves, right? And, and it makes sense that we're different. I mean, I am Mexican, I'm Hispanic, and I do think of myself that, you know, I've had sometimes different motivations. Maybe I'm a little bit more focused on, on, on certain things that are culturally stronger for me, et cetera. And so it may or may not be, there may or may not be differences. Um, what we, it's kind of really hard, right? To extract the motivations of actual entrepreneurs. You can go and ask them, but, um, but it's, you know, most of us, it's, it's sort of very tricky to, to understand the motivations, et cetera. And so what we, what we wanted to do is actually focus on two motivations, right? Or three, but motivations that, are, that we think really represent sort of two ends of the story. On the one hand, there's this idea of like, you know, you know if you're starting a company, one goal that you may have is to make money. And so here's Paul Graham, the co-founder of Y Combinator. Some of you guys may may know this uh, incubator quite well. It says, if you want to get rich, I think your best bet would be to start or join a startup. That's been a reliable way to get rich for hundreds of years, right? And so his point is, you know, get making sure you, you make a lot of income is a, is a good motivation to starting a company. Indeed, if you look today at the um, kind of almost all of the kind of top billionaires at, at Forbes, et cetera, most of them are entrepreneurs. Here's the second one. Um, motivation, this one's different, right? This is Steve Jobs. We're here to put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why even be here? This is not about making money, but this is maybe about having a little bit more of a social impact. Um, here's Muhammad Yunus, your sort of Nobel Prize winner. He says, there are two kinds of businesses in the world. One is a business which makes money. The other solves the problems of the world. And we wanted to understand variation across these two dimensions. We're going to call them social impact and profit. Across a range, you know, we wanted to stem across culture and demographics, etc. I'm going to show you the gender piece right now as we move through, but you know, we also have culture and other things. Um, and so, what do we do? Well, we work with MIT on this competition called the Inclusive Innovation Challenge. This is not a challenge for students; it's a challenge for um, anybody that wants to apply. And the idea is, we're, they're going to find really innovative entrepreneurs and try to get them to um, to potentiate them so they can succeed in the market. And what we did was they allowed us to uh, run an experiment in the recruiting phase of which entrepreneurs would apply. They had big email lists of potential entrepreneurs, et cetera, and vary the message we sent out when we recruited, right? To some people, we gave this social message. Here's how the email looked, right? Create greater share prosperity, register for MIT IAC today, win the opportunity to maximize the difference you're making in the world using tech for good, right? So sort of the ideas that, that, that are consistent here uh, with you guys' goals. Here's a very different one, focused on money. We're, we're not about share prosperity, but rather, right, there's more than 1.6 million in price money registered today for the MIT IIC win price money and additional opportunities for funding. Here's a third one. Um, sorry, my, my slides are moving by themselves. Um, register today, this is a neutral one, register today for the MIT IAC when pre by presenting your innovative solutions. And we looked at a series of outcomes, right? We said, well, if we email people this, you know, who's more and less likely to click? So it's like a private, kind of very private response, right? When we all just choose to click on, on an email, it's not because we expect our audience or anything, it's just my, our private interest. And so that may be a measure of motivation, or we can look at whether they're more or less likely to apply. That's like a more commitment, so that we like. 
but that may be more sensitive to the fact that you know, there's a bit more of a you know you don't apply only because because of your interest but also what you know which competition you expect to refer for you etc anyways that's what we did and basically across and then the third one we also grabbed all of angel lists um so we did this with the mit iic email list we did this with the, um sorry MIT, the angel list so if anybody here is familiar with angel list they're sort of a big uh angel investing company basically includes every kind of growth tech oriented entrepreneur in the united states uh with a reasonable chance of success and so we were able to partner with them to send these emails etc and get to kind of to do these experiments let me uh run through it but um you know here's our regressions if you love statistics uh let me show you instead these 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 graphs right here is basically the key takeaway. When you compare the money treatment versus the social treatment, we find that men, right, compared to compared to to the to other men that receive the social treatment, they respond a lot more to the sorry, compared right, compared to other men, they respond a lot more to this money. That means if two men, one gets the money kind of message that says sort of get $1.6 million in prices, etc., they are 52% more likely to click in the in that email than sort of uh, if they get the if they get the social message about share prosperity. With women entrepreneurs in this set of innovative entrepreneurs, we found the opposite. We found the opposite uh, that it was really sort of these this uh, negative effect, right? The more um, you know, when they got women when they got the money message versus the social message, there were. 29% less likely to click in that money message, right? And so we found interesting differences. We also found them comparing this neutral message that I showed you. So it really, it didn't seem to be um, something about the money per se, but it was how it was contrasting to the social piece, right? So for example, when you looked at the neutral message versus the social one, men were also more likely to click in the neutral message whereas women were also less likely to click on that. So that we found very interesting. I would say this is a paper that for me has generated more questions than answers. And so I, you know, this is, you know, we, we, we want to be as best scientists. And so we just document the facts. And, and this is as far as we got in this case. Here's something about culture. There's also cultural effects. Let me skip over that. Um, you know, as I said, there's angel list. We find the same things with angel list and here's with applications, um, you again see you know, you can focus on this kind of female times money effect that it's equally negative. And so we got the same, um, the same kind of, the same kind of effects across three different sub experiments, you could say, uh, leading us to two big takeaways, right? First, within this set, right? We don't know why these things are different, but within this set of already innovative entrepreneurs, we actually uncover large systematic difference in what appear to be their motivations or at least their response to interest when we, when we, when we email them these messages. Um, and so we're, we think we had a little bit more because we had potentially go beyond just difference in pipeline, et cetera, to kind of recognize difference in motivations themselves. For example, um, when one considers um, uh, the, the, you know, why there's a lot less women, uh, one can think about messaging or kind of the, the, the way one thinks about entrepreneurship can shape entry and things like that. Okay. so. That's number two, and I still have um, 10 minutes, perfect. So the third thing I wanted to, to tell you about, so that's what, we're, that's what we've seen, right? We've seen this long portion of the gender gap. It's a little bit sobering. It's a little bit sad because it seems large and very slowly increasing. And we kind of feel like I think society has advanced. I like to think society has advanced over the last 20 years. And then you see these gaps and you're like, ah, I just, you know, you, you don't grasp that. Then I, I, you know, we looked into motivations of people that are already, right? So this is not pipeline anymore, that are already entrepreneurs. And we uncovered some interesting differences uh, that might tell us something extra. Maybe, you know, that will help us understand a little bit better why they're missing. Uh, let me give you now a little bit something that is a little bit more uplifting. But this, in this case, again, um, it's actually a little bit puzzling to me as well. I'll, do, I'll, I'll say that. It is the impact of COVID-19 on the entrepreneurship gender gap. Um, and so using the kind of the same approach I showed you for, for, the, for the California, Massachusetts kind of gender gap since 1995, uh, this is with some other co-authors. 
uh, with that I did this broader startup cartography project. And we actually were able, in this case, to get very recent data for Texas, right? It just happened to be there um, and it was really easy. And we, and we plotted this plot, which I think is really interesting, right? The red line, the red line is the share of the, the kind of the quantity of businesses started by women uh, kind of relative to, to sort of to, to 2019. So it's, you, know, you can see basically in 2019, uh, it's around one. And the, green, the black line, right, is the same thing, but for men. And basically what we see is that, you know, the, the, they're, they're both adjusted to one, right? So men and women are not having the same level of entrepreneurship. They're both just adjusted to their baseline and plotted together. Um, and what we see is you're, you're sort of, they're moving along, you know, in typical variation of the year. For example, we see here, there's a Christmas drop and a Thanksgiving drop, and there's always a little bit of a boom in April because, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, but these are the dynamics of business formation, etc. Then COVID hits. COVID hits and everybody produces a lot less companies. Um, this is when the COVID lockdown starts and there's many reasons for that, you know, but it's just, you know, there's a panic. There's a sense that there's a lot of uncertainty about what to do. Uh, there's, it's unclear sort of exactly, you know, you're, where, where the demand's gonna be, et cetera. Um, then the first stimulus checks come, check comes in, right? This is April 15, April 15. And we see an increase in entrepreneurship, right? That's not the only thing that happened in April 15. Uh, New York was getting better. The summer actually had very low COVID cases, et cetera. But I think what's interesting is that we see a big divergence in this case um, across firms founded by men and by women. Uh, we actually see that while men increase, you know, what looks like 20%, women increase more like 40%. And we see that dynamic, you know, it's like, it seems like sort of, it equalizes again, but then when the second stimulus checks comes in, you know, this is in, in the end of December, uh, we actually see that boost again. And so it's interesting, right? We're, we're starting to see uh, what looks a little bit, a little bit like a potential reduction of the gender gap uh, during COVID. Now, I would recognize that you know, there's a, you know, there's a disproportionate increase in female-led entrepreneurship after a first and second stimulus check. And basically in this case, you know, for the Texas case, I showed you 22% for California, Massachusetts, for Texas, at this point in time, women account for 25% of companies and they jump to 30%. So, you know, that's again, sort of some closer reduction in the, in the gap. Um, you know, here's by the type of companies and we find that it's really those, this is not high growth entrepreneurship that is closing here actually. Um, it's actually, you know, if you look, these are local, local LLC. So you guys, you know, you're all ambitious entrepreneurs. And so I'm sure most of 87% of your companies are registered in Delaware corporations, seeking investors, etc. It turns out Delaware corporations only account for 4% of companies in New York. Most companies are just LLCs, like, like people having a restaurant, et cetera. So that's where we're seeing this increase, which is consistent with the idea that it is, it is really these um, the stimulus checks coming in, potentially something to do with uh, cash constraints. Here's a, you know, our data for Florida was not great, but when you, because it sort of ends already um, by September, but we're kind of seeing the same dynamic there. Okay. so. Takeaways from this piece is that there's a significant increase in total women entrepreneurship leading to a reduction in the gender gap. This is particularly driven by local rather than tech or high growth entrepreneurship and increase significantly around timing of stimulus checks. Um, understanding the implications of this is also, I think, an interesting question um, to ponder on. Um, so that's what I had. These are three different sets of results uh, that I wanted to share with you. Let me just review that very quickly. The first thing I showed you was this Guzman and Cash Purchasing Study, Gender Gap in Entrepreneurship. Um, I hope I was able to document some piece of that for you, how big it is in the economy, uh, how persistent and sort of how it has evolved over time. Um, one takeaway, so I have like here in red, a takeaway of that, like or a, or a kind of call to policy or action is, is sort of, uh, we need to support institutions and changes that encourage the entry of more and more growth oriented, tech oriented entrepreneurs not only existing entrepreneurs. And so one takeaway for me there is if you really want to target the gender gap and you, you could imagine other gaps um, in entrepreneurship, 
it's not enough to support the entrepreneurs that, are, that exist today, but there's also, you know, taking this pipeline perspective makes you think, um, what about the people that, you know, there's a sense that there's a lot of missing um, entrepreneurs that we might, we should also support and encourage. Uh, second thing that I showed you uh, was this motivations idea uh, within innovative entrepreneurs. So these are the people that did make it at the end of the pipeline. We observed meaningful difference in the response to different motivations. This was not, you know, I mentioned the gender piece. There's also big differences by culture, by the way. Um, and so um, changing the gender gap could also, uh, or closing the gender gap could also require not only sort of seeking women and, and supporting them to enter entrepreneurship, as I showed you in the previous slide, but also potentially changing things like messaging and culture, right? If you, uh, you know, that could stand beyond that and, and sort of, what people are, the people that we're seeing, what they seem to be seeking in it uh, actually seems slightly different. Uh, it also means a trade-off, right? Because we didn't see what any of these dimensions support both genders or all cultures, but some people seeking different things. One focus on one could reduce a focus on another and it's useful to understand that. Um, you know, and so these two really sort of could help you understand or think about this missing women entrepreneurs problem if we'd like to call that the problem. And the third thing that I showed you was this uh, other paper, right? COVID and entrepreneurship, which was, uh, there appears to be a recent increase around COVID uh, that seems to be really interesting. And we're all really excited about what it can mean. Uh, it's not clear whether, whether um, this comes from, you know, from other social moments, et cetera, but, it, but it, I think the timing appears uh, there was not something that was kind of trending from 2019, but something very unique to COVID, at least in the way that these graphs show it. Um, so that's really all I had. I, I hope I did well in time, uh, but that's really all I had. Uh, here's my email, my Twitter, and my homepage. Uh, so I look forward to your questions, but also please uh, reach out and stay in touch. And for the students, uh, I hope to see an entrepreneurial strategy, but otherwise, uh, I hope to stay in touch with everybody. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn off my screen sharing and I look forward to, to the questions. Thank you so much, Jorge. That was so captivating and thought provoking. Now I'd like to take a moment to open it up to questions. I see that we do have one question uh, from Lindsay and she has a question about the MIT IIC study. As a female entrepreneur, um, she can tell that she'd be likely to respond to the social good messaging more so than the funding messaging, but it's not because she's motivated by money. It's because she knows that funding is very difficult for female founders Absolutely. to access and therefore would probably be more likely to be accepted into the socially oriented program. So how do you account for that? Absolutely. I mean, that is, that is a great question, right? And that is why, even though applications seem like the thing you want to look at because it's like actual people applying. Uh, we were not as excited about that outcome measure in our case because precisely, uh, you know, when you apply somewhere, you're considering both yourself and your interest, but also kind of that, that, the audience and how you expect the judging panel to look into that. And so if you expect the judges to have these preferences, even though you don't share them, then you would, you would kind of focus on that. That's a great point. Uh, we thought that, and you know, this has, this is not bulletproof. I agree, Lindsay, thank you for your question. Uh, we thought that being able to look at immediate clicks when people get the emails, uh, hopefully allowed for a little bit of that deeper sense of uh, personal motivations, right? And just what interests you when you get an email and you click on it, uh, rather than trying to appeal to an audience. I do get the point that you know, um, when you're sort of, if you're, since you're an entrepreneur, you're also clicking, thinking obviously where you're going to apply later on. So it's not bulletproof. Uh, and I think your question about why is that really happening is really, uh, it's really an important thing to figure out. Awesome. We have a couple more questions. I'll go through them. We have one from Kristen. What advice do you have for female entrepreneurs when going to VCs for funding? Yeah, I mean, I I know Dana presented, uh, and I think she's she's really, um, you know, sometimes as a professor you kind of face these two challenges, right? And I think 
you guys are really interested in social movement in like, you know, in part of the social movement, then it makes sense. Sometimes you want to change the world and you're just so mad that the world is wrong and you want to do it right. And other times you feel like this is the world we live in. How can I just succeed in the reality, accepting that people are biased and that kind of thing. Taking that, so mostly I kind of took that first perspective today, but taking that second perspective, uh, there's a few things where we see a little bit more difference in the likelihood to fundraise. Uh, one of them uh, seems to be that, you know, and I don't know if Dana presented this or not, seems to be that uh, women are discounted when there's something in the investor's mind about industry fit, right? So, you know, if women are selling, um, you know, something with e-commerce or fashion, then, then it makes sense. But if it's semiconductors, which is, there's no reason to think it's like manly, then, pe but it, it has like a high share of men, there's discount for that. Uh, a second piece is, is uh, so, so I think that's one fact that one could choose to accept and try to deal with it. Uh, there seems to be some evidence for homophily. That means that people like you support you more uh, and, and, and in that sense, and there seems to be evidence in, in our results of, uh, a statistical kind of effect, which means you want to make it very clear that you're great. Uh, and then, you know, if you have, for example, when we see, when we see startups have a patent, gender seems to matter a lot less because there's all these other clear indicators. Um, when, when it's unclear, people kind of, their bias wakes, their biases wake up a little bit. Uh, and, and so that those are things that I hope they're helpful, though I know they can be difficult to, to, to kind of achieve. Absolutely. And we have a question from Joy. Um, could the entrepreneurship gender gap after COVID be correlated to the COVID gender gap on employment growth? This might make it seem that women have fewer options across the board. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, right? The, I think, you know, it is certainly possible, absolutely. Uh, in our case, because you, you could totally be self-employed without registering any company. You just go and consult for your friend or whatever it is. And a lot of you might have filed as, you know, what's a schedule C uh, in your taxes, which is like, uh, you know, self-employed. And so we feel the process of going and registering an actual company is slightly more, has a slightly more intention. Uh, we don't have, I don't, I didn't show it here, but when you look at the types of companies, there seems to be a little bit of response to market demand in the sense that, for example, companies around cleaning, companies around virtual, companies around education, online learning, those seem to be the areas where it's really increasing. So, which is conceived, and like restaurants is not increasing, which makes sense because there was no clear demand for that. On the other, so that sense, it means that it's a little bit more than a solution of last resort. Um, on the other hand, right, the response of the stimulus directly uh, does suggest that interplay with cash constraints. It could be that, you know, that capital, you know, there, that the potential women entrepreneurs were slightly lower capitalized than the potential men entrepreneurs. And so the stimulus was able to give them that extra boost a little bit more. But I think, I think it's very possible and, and that's an interesting piece to think about more. Thank you. We have another question from Mariana. Um, wondering if there has been any evidence from your research that indicates that there is some degree of backlash efforts uh, for women entrepreneurs who are perceived as being motivated by money. That's really, that, that is really interesting. I, uh, so I don't have evidence of that, um, but I don't have evidence negating that either. Um, I, my own intuition, you know, my own experience, understanding the, the kind of dynamics of it all, in my perspective of seeing it, is that uh, there's some reality to that. Uh, I think one case, we actually see this in class, um, we talk about Kylie Jenner, which, you know, everybody was so frustrated in different media that she was uh, not really a self-made entrepreneur because she had all these prior advantages, et cetera. Uh, it was just, for example, curious because when Donald Trump, to call a different example, was very successful, there was not that level of frustration of his prior advantages. And so it seemed like, 
you know, this kind of self-made title was more frustrating for Kylie Jenner. And one possibility should be that there was, could be that there was one of these kind of, as you're saying, there's a perception that making a lot of money uh, and seeking that and, and sort of, or something like that was not clicking. So I, 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 but I, so my intuition tells me you're right, but I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's evidence yet in, in research studies. And we have another question from Shelley. Um, outside of the data in your study, what are some additional factors other than funding that you would expect that lead to an increase in female entrepreneurship during COVID? So I think, I mean, there's, there's a few things that could be going on. And um, I think there's three things in my mind that could matter. Um, we also see a huge increase, for example, in black entrepreneurship. And so at some point we wondered if there was like a cultural effect because there's so much kind of uh, things going on over the summer that people could get, could get more kind of self-reliance and more intent to do something. Uh, with women, it's, it's less clear uh, because, you know, Me Too and all that stuff was a year before. Um, and so we don't see that as much. I think, um, but I do feel that people that there was a little, you know, that possibly there was a little bit of a kind of existential moment that um, that when people were stuck at home about just trying to focus on things that matter or, or things that, you know, that thing you always wanted to do. Uh, there's a little bit of an economic shock. So it's, it's natural that there's more entrepreneurship because there's a, there's a need. Uh, and, you know, one thing you see a lot is that there's a big need in what people call the caring economy, right? And to the extent that that works, that can be more successful. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think that's as far as I've been able to think, but uh, there could be other reasons. Uh, and, and I think there's still a lot, to, a lot to figure out. Yeah, and we have one last question from Betty. Um, do you have any information on the age of these entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs especially as it relates to the COVID stimulus and startup efforts? Yeah, so, I mean, we have some, so we, we do not have information on these specific entrepreneurs. Uh, we only observe what the data they have in their filing. Yet there is other evidence on, on entrepreneurs, um, you know, and, and for example, at what age do successful, are successful companies founded and things like that. And one pattern that comes out of that is that it seems to be, you know, that there's a lot of middle age success or, you know, it's hard to define middle age when you're yourself are in middle age. You always kind of want to think it's later, but um, it, you know, people amongst 35 and like 50, they're, they're that, for example, like, you know, finish your MBA, work for some time, get real industry experience, get connections, get a little bit more management uh, experience, then go and, and it seems that, you know, across genders, et cetera, that seems to be where most, uh, where most success happens. It is also the most common age range to be an entrepreneur, except for kind of rich people in their 70s that uh, choose to start a company as a semi-retirement type of approach. Great. Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you all for attending. Now I'll conclude this session. I encourage everyone to return at 1150 for the next session with James Carter. Thank you, everybody. James is great. I'm a big fan of him. I hope you enjoy his session. It was really nice to see everybody.